Good evening. The hour of seven o'clock has come and gone, but we are uh, calling the Social Services Committee to order. Jessica, can you please call the roll? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Chair Olds Fry. Present. Samantha Nagola. Uh, I'm sorry, Amanda Nagola. Present. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Hayes. Present. Perfect. Council Member Burns. Here. And uh, Renee Phillips. Present. Perfect. With the quorum being present, we will move to our first order of business, which is an approval of the meeting minutes for February. The meeting minutes are attached. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes as written? So moves. Thank you. Do it. Thank you. The second. Jessica, can you please call the roll? Are we can we approve a voice vote? Yeah. Can we you can do a voice vote? Yeah. We'll do a voice vote for approval. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. And a voice vote. The minutes are approved and we will move to public comment. Do we have any public comment this evening? We do not. Nobody is signed up online uh, nor in person. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. We'll move to our next item of business, which is our 2526 funding discussion. Yes. And so we have a presentation? Yes, we do. Go ahead. I'm sorry, would you mind going to slide four, please? Thank you so much. I actually. Uh, slide five, please. <laughs> um, so thank you guys so much. First, let me say I apologize. I am uh, not there to join everyone in person. Uh, I had a family emergency. So uh, big thanks to Marion for being there in person and, and helping to support the meeting. And thank you to everyone who is in attendance. Um, after our meeting in February, I wanted to, staff wanted to um, reframe the priorities conversation to include or to provide more information to the committee. Um, the committee had questions at our last meeting about um, housing supports and what else uh, is available to help people remain in housing or to help improve affordable housing. Um, and there were also questions about um, community partner, um, or excuse me, um, community stakeholder um, needs assessments. I apologize. So, so staff is prepared to talk about uh, the community needs assessments provided by our hospitals um, at a, a hyper local level. Um, we're also looking at sort of community needs across our country. We will have more information um, as we go. Uh, I also wanted to touch on the SSE's um, purpose and the ordinance driving SSE in case we, the committee wanted to consider changes at a future date. Um, I wanted to say that it's by ordinance that, that so any changes would have to go through a process. Um, and then I wanted to spend the bulk of the time reviewing the um, considerations that were brought up at the last meeting um, and talking about um, recommendations and possible next steps. So uh, let's move on and review our sort of city support programs. Uh, the city offers our general assistance program, which is a monthly subsidy program. Um, we also have the emergency assistance program, which is a one-time payment to households. It's actually um, for a, a major life crisis or event. Uh, so general assistance, and the numbers are up there in terms of how many households the city is able to support and in what amounts. Um, typically those payments do go to support housing. Um, the GA program also offers additional supports for households that receive GA around workforce development. Um, and I would say case management light, 
to help households remain stable in our community. Uh, moving along, we have our next slide, please, Marianne. We have our Community Member Relief Fund and our Refugee Assistance Program. So Evanston, as a welcoming city, does offer uh, a one-time relief payment to uh, households uh, that are Evanston residents but do not qualify for emergency or general assistance. So these are households that are undocumented. Um, and these this one-time payment uh, in 2023 for the households awarded, the majority of the funds went to help support rent. Um, in some cases, it was to help um, with utility payments, but for the most part, it was rent. Can I also just say, because I'm um, participating remotely, if you guys can't hear me or if there are any questions, please feel free to jump in and let me know. I will do my best to pause as we go through these slides. Great. We can hear you clearly and we will definitely jump in if, if the need arises. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the city also has a guaranteed income program. This is uh, like a universal basic income program. Uh, it was provided in 23 and approved again for uh, our 2024 calendar year. And um, households have to income qualify for this program. Um, eligible households are at uh, 250 at or less than 250% of the federal poverty, or excuse me, not less than, greater than 250% of the federal poverty uh, line. And what this means for a household of one, uh, it means that that household makes under $15,000 a year. And for a household of four, uh, that household makes under $30,000 a year. So our guaranteed income program provides uh, $500 per month for one year for these households. Um, next slide, please. Yep, yeah. now we're moving into our workforce development program. Um, the workforce development programs run from the city uh, really focus on high growth areas um, and we rely on our community partners. So we're looking at the healthcare industry uh, in partnership with North Shore, uh, Evanston North Shore Hospital. Uh, we're looking at careers in senior care with our retirement and assisted uh, senior living um, community partners. Um, we also offer the lead service replacement line through um, which, which provides an internship for residents to work with our public works department. Um, and then our GROW program is more of like a general career coaching and career support program. Uh, next slide, please. And then in um, calendar year 23, here is just an example of some of the achievements of these, pro these programs. Um, and I think it really speaks to their success that we had as many residents participate as we did. Um, and our workforce development team is uh, top notch, top notch. So if there are additional questions about workforce development, perhaps we can have staff uh, come in and, and do a presentation. But this is just to provide an overview of some of the city programs. And then finally, in a category of its own, I'm sorry, thank you, Marion. Uh, we have our reparations program, um, which provides a $25,000 disbursement to eligible households. Um, and I've we provided numbers about uh, the households who have received um, that distribution to date. And it's not a housing program, but you could say a majority or a number of households did um, opt to receive um, cash for home improvements. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Yep. Now we're going to talk about our, I'm just going to review briefly our federally funded programs. Um, so we're going to start with the programs that provide a direct housing subsidy. 
So this is our home Tibra program uh, that worked with seven families in the last year. ESG prevention. Um, this is specifically for households at imminent risk of eviction. Um, and our rapid rehousing, our ESG rapid rehousing, and this is for uh, households that have an Evanston connection that were um, homeless at the time of entering the program. ESG also provides um, support for street outreach and shelter operations, uh, but this support um, is in the form of programming and not a direct subsidy to participants, but street outreach, uh, like shelter operations provides food and uh, healthcare and street outreach also provides um, hygiene kits and support. So critically important programs. The one thing that I wanted to point out about ESG is um, using the federal funds in this way towards these programs there's also a match component, a match requirement. So the two agencies receiving ESG, Connections for the Homeless, and um, in a much smaller amount, the YWCA, specifically for shelter support, is obligated by the grant to show at least as much funding as they receive um, as a stipulation of, of the award. And our match requirement, our ESG, our total ESG amount always hovers around $150,000. But you can see the match requirement far exceeds that amount. And while the match doesn't all go toward housing subsidy, uh, the staff support that the match also provides um, allows Connections staff to leverage other grants for direct subsidies, including, um, you know, Cook County funding, um, our continuum of care funding, and those funding streams do have a direct subsidy component that people are eligible for. The other thing that I wanted to point out about ESG is that what we're finding in this past year with the program is that we're for several reasons, Connections is almost having trouble expending ESG funds under the rapid rehousing category and the prevention category. Um, and this is because for rapid rehousing, households have to be uh, at or below 30% area median income. And people, households can be housed but have trouble um, finding work that can support the rents in Evanston once the subsidy is no longer available. So ESG for direct housing support, there, there's a 24 month cap um, within a 36 month window. Um, and typically what happens is households receive uh, full rent support um, and security deposits uh, for the first, you know, they get full rent for three or six months to allow a household to stabilize. And then as the household is able to find work or get enrolled in support benefits, uh, the idea is that the amount of ESG support is reduced as the household income increases. Um, and we're finding that, again, because of COVID, because of the housing crisis, because of a number of factors, um, households are really struggling to achieve stability. Um, we're also finding that there are not um, units in Evanston uh, that fall mm -hmm. under um, the HUD small area fair market rent guidelines. So HUD sets a cap 
for the amount of rent a unit can um, request from a household or the amount of rent a household can pay for a unit. Um, and that's usually under uh, rents in Evanston, or it's very hard to, to find rents that fall within those HUD, HUD guidelines. Jessica, this is Samantha, uh, or this is Samantha. Can you give me a, what is like less than 30% of the median area income? Like, what is that number? I apologize, I don't know it. Or ballparkish. Oh, okay. So thank you for saying ballpark because I apologize. I don't have that number in front of me. Um, okay. but you can look it up on Google. Sorry, too close. I just didn't know. I know the FPL. I don't know the Evan. The if you give me a second. Just type that in under HUD, the HUD, and then Evanston, whatever we just said. All right. And then do you... So right now, uh, 30% area median income for a household of one is... Twenty-three thousand dollars, hundred and ninety, um, for a household of three is twenty-one, twenty-nine thousand dollars, seven hundred and ninety, and household of five is thirty-five thousand seven sixty. Okay, is that the HUD one? The HUD um data? Yeah. Okay. That's the data that we use um for um our programs. Yes, and then the. I apologize, you said it quickly and it made sense, but the fair housing value. Fair housing market rent? That's the word. Yep. The fair market rent, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so for 2024, um, actually they went up in 2024 by a bit, which was very welcome because it has been a struggle. Um, if you give me a second, I will find that for you. And so it's uh, you look it up by the code. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's by zip code. Um, a studio, uh, essentially the fact that it's by zip code will tend to um, make it more likely that they'll find a unit, unit in 60201. I, I have those numbers, Marion. For an efficiency or for a one bedroom, uh, the maximum rent is $1,780. And for a three bedroom, for you know a family, would be um, two thousand five hundred ninety dollars in six hundred two hundred one, and it drops a little for six hundred two hundred two. Um, for a one bedroom unit, it's one thousand four hundred seventy dollars, and for a three bedroom, it's two thousand one hundred forty dollars. And that's the twenty three or the twenty four. Uh, that is twenty three. Oh, I'm sorry. Do we have twenty four? I have 24. Um, I'm sorry. No. That's so um, one bedroom in 60201 is 2100. Three bedroom is 3040. Is that what HUD will pay or that's what that's the rent the, is? No, that's the absolute max mm -hmm. uh, that a, a unit can be at all included. Um, so if you can find a unit within those prices, then... Yeah. the assistance is not being able to be used. So there, there is quite a bit of a difference between last year and this year. Mm -hmm. um, we're hoping that's going to help. Um, but what we're finding is that to Jessica's point, when it comes to sustainability, the assistance is only limited. So then the landlords get nervous because the rents are so high, those fair market rents are helpful, but then it makes it that much harder for the families to be sustainable. Thank you. Very succinct. We were also looking at like the average rents in Evanston and it fluctuates. Uh, but at one point, the average rent for a three bedroom was double the HUD allowable limit. Mm -hmm. And that's gone down. But um, that's just an example of the, the disparity between what HUD allows and what the average rents are in Evanston. It's very challenging. Thank you. That was super helpful to just put it all into context. Thank you for the question. Okay. So I'd be remiss. Uh, the next slide just briefly lists the um, 
I'm sorry, Mary, did you go to the next slide, please? Yep. Um, the next slide. Is that the slide you want or do you want the next slide? Um, no, next two slides, please. So that's ESG additional support. Um, yep, and now we're in the match and, and leverage section. Um, so again, I can't stress enough that that connections uh, can can use other grant sources for direct subsidies, um, but they would not be able to do that without some staff support. And in fact, uh, a lack of staff can can provide a, a bottleneck. Um, but we do get other connections, gets other funding from the county, from the state, from our continuum of care, because we're all working in partnership. Um, so that leverage component is critical. And uh, I did get confirmation that that match number of $549,236, that was direct pass through, direct subsidy. Um, that Connections was able to help with, whether that was rent or um, utility payments, um, security deposit, security deposits. Okay, next slide, please. And then we have our CDBG and city funded uh, public services. This is a familiar list to everyone, but I, I couldn't exclude them uh, as in our safety net. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, we have ARPA funds um, that were committed and approved by vote uh, for affordable housing subsidies. So $810,000 uh, awarded for affordable housing subsidies and then support for refugee housing uh, in the amount of $645,000. So those programs haven't been set up yet. They're not in place yet, but that support is coming. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna look at, um, to the points that were brought up at the last meeting, what our community partners are seeing in terms of our community's needs. Um, so we start with St. Francis. Um, and the, the key takeaways here, I think, were um, access to food. That has been a challenge since COVID, and it still persists in our community. Um, St. Francis, this community needs assessment uh, was their most recent uh, needs assessment, and it was a re 2022 review for 2023. Um, they also identify, St. Francis also identifies um, connections to other community supports, um, mental health and um, support to address substance use disorders. Uh, next slide, please. Yep. North Shore has some similar themes from their uh, community needs assessment in terms of mental health and substance abuse. They certainly recognize uh, health inequities, poverty, and violence as key um, areas of concern and priorities in our community. Um, North Shore also recognizes, you know, that that the population that SSC is driving funds to support is the same population that they are looking to support. Um, so low-income households, um, our BIPOC ho households, our limited English proficiency uh, population, um, they also identify medically underserved <laughs> as a hospital, which we don't, but agreed. Uh, next slide, please. We also see these trends uh, replicated at the state level and the federal level. Um, so this is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and then next slide, please. So after that sort of community overview, um, I just wanted to touch briefly on SSC's mission. 
and and what um, our responsibilities are by ordinance. So again, our purpose in alignment with our community needs, in alignment with city council goals, um, are to support our low and moderate income households. Um, we have to comply with federally mandated restrictions. Um, and we definitely um, want to con build equity into the work that we do um, by ensuring access to opportunities and helping people thrive in our community. Next slide, please. So more specifically, um, according to our ordinance, um, SSC is an advisory body to city council. We make funding recommendations to city council for services that address a broad range of needs. Um, next slide, please. We chose to break up these needs under our categories of case management, safety net, and support services. Next slide, please. Yep. So now we're getting into the meat of our discussion or considerations. Uh, next slide, please. These were some of the points. I'm going to linger on this slide for a moment because these are the my takeaways from our last meeting. Um, and so I'm going to give everyone a minute to look over them and then let me know if there are any thoughts or adjustments. That aligns with my recollection. I am seeing Vice Chair Nicola nod her head. Anybody, any comments, edits? No comments at this time, it appears. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Next slide, please. We also discussed at our last meeting some challenges um, with the assessment process and reporting process. Um, and so things that staff will work harder to pull out more information around or provide more transparency around would be um, program budgets and agency budgets and budget information. Um, and we're also reviewing the way we quantify service impact. So if there are wait lists for services, if people are turned away, um, that could be an indicator of a demand for service. So should the committee choose, you know, we, we say that city funding should go to expand and a program's capacity to support Evanston residents and serve Evanston residents. Um, that has always been, uh, that has historically been the goal of our funding. Um, sometimes, programs that are running and new to the committee, if they have a track record of providing services to Evanston residents that fall within um, our goals, um, I think, you know, the, the committee would be interested, what I heard from the meetings that the committee would be interested in considering those programs. Um, the creation of new programs to meet our funding requirements. I didn't bring this up at the last meeting, but after consideration, uh, I wanted to point out that that might be challenging for agencies. Uh, it's risky to rely on city funding. We don't always fully fund. Um, and so agencies creating new programs, that's that's it's a big startup for them. It's pretty risky. And even in the application process, we ask them to provide a past track record of results. Um, that being said, we are always looking at identifying gaps in our our network of support. Um, but really, the goal is, that city funding should be increasing, like providing support for Evanston residents or allow the program to provide improved capacity to serve Evanston residents. 
Um, next slide, please. So some of the recommendations that we've touched on in the past um, include, you know, services to Evanston residents, reviewing programs that serve 50% or more, at least 50% Evanston residents. Um, we do look for an equity impact. So programs that are serving more than 50% of our BIPOC residents could be a consideration. Um, we could also um, weave equity into the work that we do by um, perhaps um, prioritizing services that support housing, um, services that support education access, as an example. Um, we have also um, historically worked to increase the application cycle or make longer grants to provide more support for programs, and that's in keeping with best practices. Um, next slide, please. We also talked about um, gathering the best information we can. Um, and I know that this is challenging because we have a number of um, community assessments and surveys, um, the results of which won't be available um, this summer or anytime soon. So I just wanted to provide a visual of the um, plans that are currently underway that could really um, provide information about our community's needs, uh, gaps, um, and what would best support um, our households sort of at risk or in need. We have our strategic housing plan uh, results could be available in August. Our inclusionary housing plan, which will be available in September. Our comprehensive plan, uh, which will be available in October. And our consolidated plan, um, which will be available in November. And just as a reminder, the consolidated plan uh, drives how we use CDBG home and ESG funding for the next five years in our community. So in order to um, create these plans, we do look at <laughs> so much data, so much data <laughs> um, to, again, understand what is happening in our community, um, the pain points. Um, we know it's, it's housing, but specifically which populations are affected, whether they're um, households with fam families or larger households, households with children, um, whether it's our senior population. Um, we look at our housing stock and our market conditions um, and then the supports available. And we really try to, um, again, in partnership with community stakeholders, um, identify how we, we hope to apply federal and local funds. Um, next slide, please. So given all of that information, um, while staff is absolutely committed to ongoing assessments of services and making that information uh, available to the committee um, through you know, summarizing reports and, and providing the information um, in the most like efficient, comprehensive, uh, way to the to the committee and the public um, from the agencies that are reporting. Um, staff also uh, is suggesting that perhaps we extend our grant cycle uh, by another year. And so rather than open our new grant cycle for the 25, 26 year um, this summer, that should the committee want to, and we don't have to make any decisions tonight, but should the committee want to, um, we could make this a renewal year and open up the new grant cycle next summer after the results of our assessments 
Um, and so then our new grant cycle would cover the 26, 27 year. So um, that is kind of where I, I stop my overview and pause for questions and discussion. Hi, Jessica. It's really nice seeing you again, even though you're far away from us. Uh, can we get back to the conversation about postponing um, an old, a beginner grant sit session now to have it be a renewal session? How would that work out regarding funding for the wraparound services we currently fund and how they would be able to uh, set up their report cycle to you and, and to us? So that's a great question. And I'm glad you brought it up because um, the Housing and Grants Division remain in contact with our Health and Human Services Division um, to talk about wraparound services. Um, I know that there is a lot of community support and there is a lot of city support. Um, there are, there's funding behind wraparound, but the actual plans have not yet been determined. So, uh, Kathy, you were at several wraparound meetings. Um, I'm going to do a quick summary of wraparound, uh, to refresh everyone's memory, uh, but the idea of wraparound services uh, was really born in partnership um, the, with the District 65, uh, District 202, uh, a lot of our community stakeholders, agency representatives that work with, you know, community members and the city uh, came together to look at the needs of families um, and wrap around Milwaukee led us through a series of workshops um, to talk about how Evanston could implement a wraparound system. And a wraparound system is a holistic case management, um, usually performed by uh, staff or an entity that has the ability to bill Medicaid to get people enrolled in Medicaid and to bill Medicaid for services. Uh, but the idea is that wraparound case managers stay with the person or family to help them very intensely uh, with every need that, that, that they could have, whether it's finding a general practitioner to finding summer camps for kids, uh, to getting criminal records sealed or expunged, uh, to finding affordable housing, sort of like any, any need that the household has, the wraparound service case manager works intensely with that household to connect them to community resources until their needs have been met and they reach stability. So in theory, I think it, first of all, let me pause. Kathy, did my summary do it justice? Am I missing anything? Yeah, that was pretty much it with faith communities and meeting the needs and being with the, but we also figured out during that session, and I hate to jump ahead, that it was an ongoing, though you have one plan that might come to conclusion, another plan may be kicked off with the successful conclusion of the first plan. And more goals will be set, so it'll progress. Yeah, yeah, um, that is a very good point. But and also, you mentioned the faith-based communities. Yes, I think the idea is that any and all um, community supports that are available would be provided to the household enrolled, and the case manager would be walking them through um, those supports. Um, for 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 as long as the household needed those supports. Um, some of the things that that we're still working out 
um, and by we, I, I don't, not me, <laughs> but the city in partnership with um, major, you know, community stakeholders, including Cradle to Career, um, both of their school districts, you know, the hospitals is, um, where would the staff come from? We, we wrap around uh, Milwaukee, and the team that that pulled this discussion, the just wrap the discussions together, did an excellent job of identifying a software system. Uh, I think it was called Eason's that would really do a great job of tracking services. Um, and the city, I believe, committed funding for Eason's, but Council Member Burns, perhaps <laughs> you know. Um, I think the challenge is in finding uh, who is going to employ the wraparound case management services and manage them and like what that looks like in that next steps. So while I think there's a lot of interest um, and support for this program, um, it's initiation and launch um, is to be determined. So, and, and that could also have impacts on the agencies or the types of services um, the Social Services Committee could recommend for support. Yeah, so your concern was it's something that you would like to have or that people would like to have funded, but it's not in the current cycle. So if we were to prolong it, they wouldn't have a chance to apply. Is that the concern? Yeah, that's, yeah. Pretty, that's pretty much my concern on one end. The second end is I was under the impression from the last meeting I went to for regarding the wraparound services is that the city had committed to this software, um, whatever this magical software is, and it was still looking for a leader, um, a leader organization, a leader department, health department was suggested, cradle to career was suggested, someone else was suggested to um, and it, I just didn't know how close they were to launching outside of the the soft the software. Um, so my fear is that that will impact money for programs that are up and running and are actually facilitating residents in the here and the now. And, and wraparound, I want to make sure I'm understanding, like, like, wraparound is just the coordination of services, right? Like, it's not the actual service. For example, somebody needs housing. Wraparound is somebody, a, care, a coordinator that helps them find housing. But they're not the housing provider. Or they need food. Maybe they help them apply for SNAP or, you know, whatever. But they're not, you know, or connect them with the food pantry. But they're not actually providing food. Am I understanding that correctly? Correct. Yes. They they are holding their they are holding their they are holding their case program for that individual family from each um, degree of whatever it is they're going to. So they're following up, and allegedly the person won't have to tell their story six different times and get lost somewhere in the mix. No, I think I very much understand how that process can be beneficial, but it's important. I think sometimes we see that like coordination is the challenge, but coordination and capacity are needed in order to be successful. Is I just want to underline that, which I didn't think you were disagreeing with. I just thought it was worth underlining is that capacity is still necessary. Right. Jessica, I wonder, are there any other pros and cons that you could identify related to continuing, you know, going into a renewal cycle versus waiting for a longer, if I said that correctly, do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, I, I do. So I think one of the, without knowing who would apply, um, one of the challenges would be um, if the social services committee doesn't have sort of clear priorities 
or even if we do have priorities, um, if all of the social service agencies that could apply for funding did, how would we, how would this committee um, measure, measure them? And if we had, if we did, let's say, uh, identify housing as a priority. Um, that could mean that we have new housing providers apply, um, like the Harbor or Family Promise. Um, and it could potentially uh, change the funding that other uh, agencies and programs receive, which is always, always a, a risk, always um, a component. Um, and if the committee didn't establish priorities, um, then it sort of leaves the gates open um, for for any and all. And then how how do we measure programs? How do we compare apples and oranges? Um, so, and I do think that potentially seeing the re results of um, the city's assessments mm -hmm. could be helpful. Marin, would you mind going back to slide 32? Oh, no, I guess you don't have to because we're out of that. Um, if, if there was an appetite to change funding, um, so right now under the current ordinance, uh, the social services committee is charged with making recommendations for a broad range of public services. Um, should the committee choose to, to narrow that, um, it would give us time to uh, perhaps look at that ordinance if that is, again, if that's something that the committee wanted to do. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, they're just um, part of the reason why there's this recommendation is because there seems to be a lot of moving parts right now and things are up in the air. And we're concerned about asking the committee to make such changes and how you're looking at services without you having any as much tools as you could if we were to wait a year. Um, I hear what you're uh, saying, Ms. Hayes, as far as kind of the timeline. And part of that was also us trying to consider wraparound services and thinking if we're changing direction too soon, then are we missing an opportunity? Kind of like if we're not doing renewal and we are instead asking the committee to make some decisions, does that mean that there wouldn't be as much opportunity to get ready to look at things maybe slightly differently next year. Um, so that was, it was kind of the other coin of the story. It, it, it We're very aware that we're asking for some kind of decision at a time where it feels a little bit like a, a transit hinge time, we'll say. Um, so we're, we're trying to be mindful of that and giving you options. Yeah. Um, may I say something? Um, of course. I think that the job training and placement and the access to healthy food um, needs to be more realistic. Um, the job training and placement, I, I assume we're speaking of safe recommendations, service that address. I, I assume we're speaking of the agencies that come ask for um, money, correct? Is well, that what we, yeah, we currently we don't fund down the committee, right? Or that yeah. establish like our charge or charge. Right. Jessica, like a like a rubric or we don't yeah. Like Jessica, do you wanna answer that? That's the list of items that are on the ordinance as part of services that could be funded by social services committee. Right. I'm saying like if necessary. if it was my agency, Renee Phillips Social Service Agency, and I came in, you wanna see some of this in the presentation or what of what they're asking for as far as money. It would be sort of a kind of, I think it's, for example, 
we did mental health as a priority a few years ago, right? Like that is, I think that's more our document in which we could say, we want people to come forward and ask us for provide proposals for case management or right. substance use or job placement and training, access to healthy food, et cetera. But it works both ways. Like we're asking and then they're responding. Yes. So yeah. we're saying the same thing. Yeah. Maybe I'll just. No, I just want to make sure. My word yeah. flow is probably off. Um, okay. Is it, a, is it a way that not necessarily prioritize, but when um, the social service agencies present job training and placement, legal services, and access to healthy food, can we make it more active or more live? Like, is there a way that we can um, ask for, I don't want to call it proof, short of somebody coming in here and saying, yeah, they gave me some food, but... <laughs> You know, job training and placement, I've learned over the past 15 years is is farce. Um, I, I want to see like job training more than giving you a piece of paper that says how to interview or giving you the coupon that says go to the closet, you know, on Chicago Avenue and get a uniform and interview clothes. Um, yes, that's job training. That's um, job readiness. But I would love for them to be more sp specific with job training and placement. Like, are they taking the, what's the, what's the test called that starts with a T? Um, oh, a lot of places have you take this particular test as far as assessment, cognitive assessment. It's called, it starts with a T, that one. Um, I can't, I can't even think of what it's called. We all know this word, but I can't think of it. So that T test, that one, <laughs> maybe, um, maybe teach them how to, or not teach them, but train them how to take that test for assessment, which is, which will help them in turn for applications and so forth and so on. Maybe showing the, um, their guests or clients, whichever they want to call them, how to actually complete an application properly. That's often missed, how to uh, complete it online and in, on paper form. If I, I found that a lot of times our guests and clients shy away from the applying for jobs because they simply don't understand those questions on the applications, and we've all struggled with some of those questions. Um, so I would like to see more of a real, real workup. Yeah, there we go. A real workup of what they're planning to do as far as job training and placement. And placement, I'm not saying go here at Valley to apply. I want like contact person and somebody that's in partnership with these agencies that will give them a job. We all can give someone a job at Valley. We probably already, we all know. So I know I know like four people at Valley now that would say, tell them Renee sent you. You know what I'm saying? You, we can all do that. But I, I would like to see the social service agencies do that. You know what I mean? Like some live context, real placement. Yeah. Of, um, I know uh, a while ago there, I don't know the agencies or whatever, but Jewel used to impact. It was, they would hire folks from um, impact to bag or whatever, depending on their cognitive level. I would like to see something like that, like somebody in cahoots with the, in partnerships with the agencies to actually give them a job and continue to work with them. And it's like a short shot, not um, a send off or as the young people say, or, or whatever. Um, so are you, I think for both for a new all and for new application, what you're sort of looking for, what are your outcomes and past performance? Like demonstrate mm -hmm. your capability Mm -hmm. And whether that's both an anecdote, which is helpful, but also, I'm, and you were talking about job placement, I think, well, how many people have you actually placed, right? Like, Correct. Mm -hmm. and, and not, and what's your ratio? Like it doesn't, 20 sounds nice, but if it's 20 to 2,000 people that you're saying you're help, like that, that ratio matters as well. Is right. That, and, and some people don't need the job placement. I'm not talking about oh, yeah, no. the person that doesn't need it and you just stick that you help place them in a job. I'm not talking about that person. If it was 20 people that actually needed the job training right. out of those 20 people or households, how, you know, what happened? What was the outcome? Can you go back one real quick? It was another one on there that I was, because my brain, it was access to healthy food. Um, I'm thinking something better than the pantry. I don't know how we can do that. Um, I think direct, like 
were, were, were you directly involved or were, did you just alert somebody of where? Yeah. yeah. So here you go. Yeah. Right. The access Referral to healthy food access. is also not a reality. Um, generally, from the case management lens, we send them to the pantries. And some of the pantries are better than others. As you know, the Everson pantries are the bomb. Like they give meat and all that. Um, the Catholic Charities one on, I forget what street that is. Um, theirs is good too, because they give whole food, whatever whole food donates at the end of the day, they give it to the pantry or the folks that come visit the pantry. But maybe, or, or like, or like um, Vineyard, you know, that's serious. But how can we get... Um, more access to healthy food other than sending them to a pantry, something like the vineyard, some, not necessarily some place, but maybe how can we get them over there without waiting in that long line? I'm talking about for the Evanston residents. And I'd also like to see, and you guys um, help me how to say this. I would love to see family promise prioritized. They're the only shelter in Evanston and the it's a private not-for-profit. We know that the connections is, not a shelter. That's a drop-in. Hilda's Place, yes, that's a shelter, but it's a day center and a shelter. No one's sleeping overnight in there, as far as I know. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, okay. So if I could jump in and, and say mm -hmm. it is tough to single out specific agencies and invite them to apply. Um, we can't show favoritism. Not necessarily the invitation. I'm not saying that, but when... Family Promise has comes to the city of Evanston with a family that is ready to return to working class society and or ready to be housed via employment or the potential of employment, maybe an offer letter. I would love to see them prioritized because it's the only shelter in Evanston and we kind of, they're kind of like on the back seat a lot. Um, or they get turned down a lot too. You mean prioritize for like wraparound mm -hmm. services and like other services? So or no, every service there is. That, that might not sound fair. It might not sound fair to other people, but I don't know why it's not fair. I mean, their family promise is here in, in Evanston. Um, fair, well, I wouldn't use that word fair. It's if, if I could jump our in, show Renee, that's here. Uh, if I could jump in and, and say, sure. because I work with Tracy McKeithen and uh, I really respect what she does in the community. Um, she and I have often been in touch. Um, one of our challenges, and I'm not going to use family promise necessarily, um, okay. but I'm going to go back to the idea of this funding building capacity to serve Evanston residents. So several years ago, years ago, um, the mental health board uh, decided to fund the harbor. And the harbor is a, a shelter. Um, they do take referrals from like YOU and um, the Connections Youth Program if they're at capacity. Um, they do work with Evanston residents. Um, and, and the Mental Health Board did give an award or recommend an award to the harbor that was approved. Um, it did not increase the harbor's capacity to serve Evanston residents. If their beds were full, even if there was someone coming from Evanston, they could not bump anyone else out to make a bed available for that Evanston resident. We also couldn't give them enough funding to create more beds or reserve a bed specifically for Evanston residents. So when we're talking about shelter, this becomes very, very challenging. Um, and we know we need more shelter capacity in our community. Um, I would also like to say that this body or, or the Mental Health Board uh, funded workforce development programs in the past. Um, the city has funded the Youth Job Center, um, and I'm not picking on them, uh, but and 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 the committee could decide to recommend them for funding again. I think the Youth Job Center is a wonderful organization. Um, sometimes one of the challenges we have again is with the that capacity component. So 
I agree that job placement agencies like Youth Job Center, like Impact Employment Program, can provide the number of participants who receive a job, the number of participants who receive um, workshop training, resume building help, uh, interview skill practice, um, and the number of people placed, the number of placements that are Evanston residents versus their other population. Um, but when we're looking at then their long-term reporting and how that funding, again, increases capacity to serve Evanston residents, um, that can be challenging. Uh, that's a challenge we can wanna take on. It sometimes can take multiple program years to show the type of results that we wanna see or mm -hmm. that the, that might speak to um, growth in capacity. If the committee would like to see more innovative programs, um, these agencies are aware of city funding and we can open up that application process again. Um, but I would again encourage the committee to then establish clear priorities because how do we choose how we're evaluating, let's say our workforce development programs? Do we give more money to let's say YJC or Evanston Scholars, which is arguably somewhat workforce development? Um, and would that lead to perhaps reducing other safety net services, which again is inevitably the case, but we would need to, staff's next step after the priorities discussion is to introduce a rubric um, where we can sort of assess applications and score applications. Um, and we want to, make sure that the way we're using the rubric or that rubric would align with priorities to categorize the programs in a way that this body agrees with or, or in a way that reflects this committee's priorities. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, point those things out. Um, I also agree with you about food programs. You know, currently we fund Meals on Wheels. It's a wonderful organization. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head if they serve 50% or more Evanston residents. Um, maybe there are other food programs that do that, do that well. Um, um. Jessica, I was um, really not, everything you said is, is the case. I agree and I understand what you're saying because you, I'm sure you have that data and knowledge way more than me. I was really talking, not the capacity, but I was talking about when um, Family Promise comes to the city of Evanston or Connections or whomever, and they have a family that's in need after they've already secured housing, um, located and secured it, meaning a lease, how can we get them the first, I don't know how to say first dibs, but can we give them priority for funding for first month rent, security pods, the first month rent, or the first three to six months subsidy? That's really what I'm talking about because the capacity at Family Promise is 15. And I think that's just a number that Tracy wants. I don't know about capacity or anything like that. I was really thinking more of um, sometimes when the families go to the city or connections or whatever, the funding's gone or it's some small, really small, minute barrier um, that somebody not even missed, but I don't want to say made up, but it it comes to the forefront that nobody's ever heard of. I got you. You know what, Renee, thank you for clarifying. It's, it's not hard just to... them, it's everybody, you know, not just them. Okay. Uh, I appreciate your clarification. Um, when it comes to families and housing in Evanston and receiving mm. subsidies, uh, whether they're coming from Family Promise or Interfaith Action 
or the harbor or any of our providers in that network. Everyone is going through a process called coordinated entry, um, and that's managed through uh, Evanston's continuum of care. Um, mm -hmm. So all of that is managed by the Alliance to End Homelessness in mm -hmm. suburban Cook County. So they have a by names list. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say many things, which I'm sure Renee, you're already aware of, but bear with me. I, okay. So everyone who enters the homeless system. HMIS, yeah. Yes, HMIS, yeah. exactly. Um, mm -hmm. And so families, households are prioritized for funding based on their HMIS, entry and their VI SPDAT score and all mm -hmm. of the funding that Evanston receives for housing through ESG mm -hmm. um, goes to is matched with uh, Evanston households coming through that coordinated entry system, whether they're coming from connections or family promise. Um, and that's the goal of coordinated entry. So it's not like households coming through connections get priority and households that come through the Y are next on the list. Everyone who's entered into HMIS and all homeless providers are required to use HMIS. Everyone going through the HMIS um, is given a VI SPDAT score and those okay. that are literally homeless or qualify um, as homeless are put, are matched um, through the coordinated entry process. So um, the agencies are still using the VI SPDAT tool? Well, some, it, I know a couple aren't, but are there still some that do? So that it, that is something that the continuum is in discussion around. Am I getting um, rid of it? I'm thinking. Sometimes Evanston residents, by virtue of the fact that they're in Evanston and Evanston is a resource-rich community, do right. not score as high on the VI SPDAT. And mm -hmm. that's where our funding is reserved for people with that Evanston link. So okay. it's not like we're just putting all of our money into our COC. And it's going right. to whoever's at the top of that list based on the VI SPDAT. Okay, yeah, because I, right I, there, I, that's not fair either. But that's uh, that's not for us, I guess. I guess that would be just for strictly AHAN to worry about and coordinated entry because they're receiving the information. They're not the actual the person the actual persons that are administrating that tool that test. So I guess it's whatever the agencies report and put in there, and. It's messy at the top right there because we don't know who took the or administered what service, what agencies administered the VIS for that or not because connections doesn't do it anymore, as I was aware from the supervisory team, they don't use it anymore. This is as of like February of twenty twenty two, they didn't use it anymore. Now things change daily. They could start up using it again, or maybe it's revamped or whatever, but that tool, the VIS for that tool is so old. Um, I, I doubt that they revise those questions at all. So I'm, I'm struggling with that. Um, Connections is a receiving agency, right? Yep. Okay. Hmm. I do know that the Alliance provides regular mandatory training for all of yes, the providers in our all CBC. Year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do know that there is bias with the VI SPDAT. Like there are definitely challenges, um, but the Alliance as the COC lead is right. yeah, responsible for coordinating all of the efforts. And, and we're really, mm -hmm. while we're not, giving up our funding, we certainly right. do follow their policies and procedures. Right. Um we, and and we want to. There are there are partners. So <clears throat> but I I will also say that 
and you know, connections is part of the alliance, uh, the alliance's coordinated entry process and part of the COC, but mm -hmm. so is impact and the why and um, a, a lot of our service providers. So it, it's a big network and we are trying to, I, I believe that the people involved in the planning I, and mm -hmm. I'm in those planning meetings are very thoughtful and conscientious and trying to make it as equ equitable and like <sighs> as we um, can. Right. And they probably are. Mm -hmm. oh. Hmm. oh, okay. Because is connection still the bank? Are they still the banker? Connections is sort of the, the banker in our, for our area. Yeah. And that is why ESG funds, Evanston's ESG dollars, while they follow the process of coordinated entry are all, like separate from coordinated entry in that mm -hmm. if there is an Evanston household applying for funds, mm -hmm. whether that household came from family promise or connections, it's the household that is put to the top of the list of receiving Evanston dollars Correct. based mm -hmm. on their vulnerability. Okay. So that's basically almost what I'm saying in a sense is the Evanston families. But then if they're the receiving agency and the banker, they're also distributing money to the local social service agencies, correct? Uh, No. Because, well, where does so the Center of Concern and Catholic Charities get their money from? Oh, they get it from the from CFC. The, with the applications or homeless prevention or... I understand what you're asking now. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Alliance also applies for ESG funds as the COC lead. So the Alliance gets its own ESG grant that it mm -hmm. distributes to... um other providers. So when you talk about right. like the, the applications, concern, so the connections, Pardon? don't they funnel through the applications for these different funds or areas, ESG, this, that, and the third, Does, don't the applications for the guests or excuse me, the clients or households, let me say that word, go through connections because they have to um, edit and review the entire packet before they even approve the money. Isn't that still connections? Um, that's connections and partnership with the Alliance. So right. it used but to be, and for prevention. you go to connections, a person that looks at these applications at connections, not the Alliance, right? Connections is our COC lead. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see what you're saying. So they're like job sharing in a sense. Is that kind of like job sharing? But I'm just trying to uh, let everybody see would the be, money flow. Yeah, would it be helpful for a future meeting to just sort of go through the the whole workflow? I think it's kind of... Yeah, I was just trying to help y'all understand how why I'm so serious about the funding and using it for Evanston residents and how if the money is funneled through the bank, we, the banker, which is Connections, but Connections... Is is our lead North Shore lead? I'm thinking you're saying, in conjunction with CLC, right? Is that kind of what you're saying, like in partnership with, or are they just job sharing? Well, I'm not sure that I'm understanding. Your okay, maybe maybe yeah. I can't talk well. Um, no, but somebody I think it's help a fair, me. No, I think it's I'm trying fair, to explain it. Maybe for just another meeting to just sort of because it is. I'll be honest. It is almost 8.30 and my brain is melting. And so I feel like if I had a visual of like how it all works, it might help me. So we can, better. what we can do is we can come back at the next meeting. We can table that. Have uh, a clear kind of yeah. explanation of how, yes. I think once everybody understands it. Through. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, once I, everybody understands that work up in that workflow, everything will make way more sense to me. Okay, and I'm thinking everybody else too. On the priorities that we're trying to set for another mm -hmm. funding season. Mm -hmm. If the banker is on the front end and the back end, it's it, you feel like you're playing three-card Molly. Um, so I understand exactly what you're saying. Okay. 
Um, I just, I wasn't trying but, to say it um, that way, but that's, yes, that's what I was saying. I was trying not to but, um, open up that can of worms. How we get our priorities mm -hmm. for the next funding cycle to, to make sense uh, for those who are willing to apply for the funds that we have in the bank? Are we going to hold some funds and say, let's see who comes to the door? Are we going to uh, say, no, we're going to renew who we have now and then bank something else later for what might happen in the future? Or are we going to challenge and say, let's solve some issues, not for just this cycle, but for cycles that come in the next five years? That's kind of where I, yeah. I, I completely understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that that has an impact on how we make a decision on those priorities. Absolutely. And that makes sense with the wraparound services. You can actually see it. Like once you see the workflow or not the, yes, the workflow and why the agencies are asking for, for certain things, look at the ap application, thumb through that BI spadet horrible thing um i have tons of copies if you want to um thumb through it and it, it's going to all make sense as to why certain it's hard for me to uh, say yes to certain agencies when um all those areas are not being met it's really difficult um but i think when all it means that's nothing wrong with me refreshing having a refresher as well once you see that workflow i guarantee we're going to start making some different decisions and it's race in there. It's not necessarily religion, but it's all kinds of everybody. It's not, yes, it's not just black or white or whatever. It's all kind of makeup. We're also forgetting about the LGBTQIA plus community. Community, we don't even talk about them a lot. You know what I'm saying? But they do have special funding at other places. I haven't heard special funding here in Evanston. They, we're, they're sent over to Howard Brown, which doesn't make sense. If right. they're from here, we got to send them to Howard Brown. They should be able to stay here right. in this town because we're very LGBTQIA friendly, I believe. And some of the other communities are copying us and piloting their programs after Evanston. Like that's for real. So we're not even thinking about those folks. So for the priorities that we have had so far, and again, as you were saying, the job training and the job placement, are we looking more, to, not just not just saying those things, but getting more in-depth thought, is the job training, I'm just using that one for right now because it's the only one I can really think of right this second, um, job training and job placement versus career development and, and sustainability. I think there's a, are, are we changing the course to say to the challenge of saying, hi, um, agencies. Yes, we know that you can have them or help them fill out an application, but can you train them on how to uh, sit for this interview, follow through with this interview, make and the other things so that they can get to a career that's functional so they can have enough money to stay in a, a housing situation that that they're able to get once they get the job. Do we still fund any agencies that do uh, job training and placement? No, I don't think connections. No, no, that's not their core function. Though. You know, they're well, housing. That's function. not their core function. Now, but that's job, part of wrapper rehouse service. For example, is a you know that that's a place that their you know their core function is to employ people. Only reason why I say that is unless we want to make that a priority, we right. don't have to make that a priority, and we could continue to support things like Aspire. So I don't know if we can pull up that. And we, we can pick up on it later too, if we run out of time, but we could just continue to direct city funds to support programs like Aspire, which are career development, workforce development programs, which they had some data on that earlier. So we can focus on what's working and not even have to go back into what we think is not working, which I think summer of 2022, it says 33 the next slide I thought was had the these were all Evanston yeah. Yeah, those are... High School graduates went through the program. I believe there's a certification involved in it. And it's all like hands-on workforce opportunities in healthcare. And so I, I just want to mm -hmm. 
Focus it wasn't us. necessarily that um, Councilman Burns. It wasn't necessarily like the focus on the job training. I think she just chose those two just, words. Yes, no, 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 we no, were no. saying, I'm, I'm saying as a whole, as a whole, right? Yes. He's, the what you just des- what you describe would be instructive for an agency that provides. I mean, maybe it's instructive for a place like Connections that tries to get people jobs. The only reason why I ruled them out is because mm-hmm. that's not their core function. They're trying to get people housed first and then refer them out to other organizations that may do career development, et cetera. But what they're really good at, right, their sweet spot is getting people housed. And I don't think we have, I don't think we have any agency that has requested funds in 2022, 2023 that do job, that really focus on job placements, placement and yeah, and and uh, job readiness. So I, what I'm asking is, is do we want that or 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 we don't have to focus on that as a committee and we could continue to find, identify these opportunities is what I'm saying. I I understand clearly what you're saying. And I know that connections is over by you. So I get it. So I'm saying this might be your baby. My connections is in the fifth floor. That's why I said that. No, the reason why I'm saying it, I'm just trying to understand what we've had a long conversation and I have, I'm not clear on what we're saying. And I want to leave here understanding what we're saying. So I think we should a- be careful of all the social service agencies that come and ask money and why, where is it going? What, like, what exactly are you going to do with it and who's going to get it? That's well, and basically I think, my concern. I think if and there's no rubric to go with it. But I think if we're able as a committee to come up with some key priorities That's that was I mean. on the list, then, yeah. and it sounds like you're mentioning some things that we should be thinking of, but maybe there's some yeah. others, or maybe we need to narrow down the list that we came up with last time, because I think that's going to shape our future conversations and the decision. So maybe, yeah, I don't know if we're able to come to some conclusion tonight, probably right. not, but mm-hmm. I think that's the direction that I'm hearing a lot of people say that they're- I just think it go. would be good if we're all on the same page with each one of the folks that come in and ask money. That's really all I'm saying. Um, yes, will it be a little bit more work for us? Probably. It might, maybe we if we go to at a slower pace. Um, yeah, I understand I that at Connections, first and foremost, they have housing- first model. I do understand that. Um, so I'm not going to get in, into what I really feel. That's It's not about what I feel. Um, Connections does good works. We all know that. Um, I'm not questioning anything either. So I'm not picking on any particular agency, which is why I also mentioned Catholic Charities, the Center of Concern, and Connections. I'm just listing the ones that I know come and ask for money from places. That's I'm just listing those because they're popular. Um, so yes, is Evanston the bomb at those things and connections? I absolutely, I'm pro Evanston, trust me. And, and so I just you, want us to make are you sound division. So job placement was just an example of, you were just using that as an example. Cause we spent a lot of time on job placement and readiness. So I thought that was. I didn't spend a lot of shop, um, time on that. She did. I was talking we, mostly like, as about housing and getting money. Yeah, I said we collectively spent a lot of time on job placement and readiness. So I didn't know if that was a particular focus area we uh, area we wanted no. to focus on moving forward. If all we're saying is that we want to come up with a a a better way, a more stringent way, whatever we want to describe it to evaluate organizations, yeah, then I understand that. I just that wasn't yeah. clear because it was we were we've been there's been a lot of things to dis- discuss today. I, I think I let, missed the last meeting, so I'm just trying to come out of it. And there wasn't it really anything in the packet, so. I'm trying to just understand what this committee is being asked to do so I can I think better prepare myself for the next. I understand. Meeting. And that's why I said once we you see that workflow of the in the workup and where the likes from starting to the from the intake to the packet to the this to the that, I'm telling you, it's gonna make all of this is just gonna come together and make so much more sense. And okay. then you're gonna be like, oh, okay. So this well, particular and Renee, meeting, perhaps you and I could schedule a meeting so that mm-hmm. I can understand the workflow and we can we can talk about it. I can get connection staff in here to present. But Council Member Burns, to your point, what we have on the screen right now is the list mm-hmm. of the agencies and programs we fund. Um, mm-hmm. Staff is suggesting that the committee can either refund these programs instead of opening up the application process again this year for 25-26. If we open up the application this year for 25 and 26, we will do that in the summer, right? And then the Social Services Committee will review those applications 
in, you know, September, October. Um, these agencies will probably apply. We could also have additional agencies like Family Promise or Center for Concern or, you know, anyone under the sun. It would, if we open up the application process again, it would really help the committee to establish priorities um, like funding housing programs. That way we know everyone with a housing program is sort of moved up to the top of the list and everyone that's not a housing program could receive a reduced or you know no award for next year. Um, if we don't want that's to- That's why I mentioned our place the readiness because I thought what we were trying to say is we want that to be a priority. Ah. Evaluation is different from what we want to prioritize. And that's where I got kind of confused. I thought yeah. we were identifying that as maybe one of the areas we want to prioritize. Okay. Well, and that's a good I'm point. The, I... I'm all for coming up with new ways to evaluate. I have a whole list of things I've been working on. I thought we were going to hold off on that to future meetings. But if we're bringing that back around, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, Jessica knows we've had a few conversations about it, um, not complete conversations because my schedule didn't allow it at the time, but I'm all for that. I'm I'm very interested in having that conversation. But at the same time, we were all, all we were also talking about how to develop priorities. And yes. that's where I got confused. Okay. Well and perhaps if we were to hold the if we were to make this upcoming grant year another renewal year, it would give the committee more time to focus on how we evaluate programs because yes council member burns i still have those kpis that you sent um and we could make that a whole meeting um yeah that goes deep and that's what i was saying and that and that's to yeah. uh um that's, i think that's what folks want to consider up here is we probably need more time to do it i don't know how much time you think we need what do you think all right so to that point I'm would would this committee want to? What do you mean? What, like, explain your question to me. Maybe uh, I'm not. Just how long do we think we need to, to your point, to kind of start at A and, and go through? You mean when we come back, we're tabling that, right? For the, tonight, but we can pick back up on it. But how long do you think it would take to kind of go through all of that? 15 minutes. Well, I think like to if you have, because she said a visual. A yeah, if you have the visual, it's easy to, I mean, we could look at it and talk about it, but explaining it, um, since we're all adults and we can understand those kind of packets, I think it would just be quick if somebody could present it and explain the packet, if that's what you're asking me, right? Not packing, I'm calling it packing, but the, the well, visual, I, visualization tool that she was talking about and actually have an intake in front of us, of like a, a mock one. And then when do we have to make a decision that. again? You said not until the summer. What was the time? If we, were to re if we weren't to be have a renewal cycle and we were to open it up for new grants, it would we would need priorities and that application process would have to start this summer. Right. So ideally priorities as soon as possible. After priorities mm -hmm. are decided, then um the work can start around putting together an evaluation tool. Uh, the evaluation tool is going to be very highly driven by the committee's priority. Um, and all of that needs to be finished by June so that we can, at the latest, and Jessica, please um, correct me if I'm wrong, so that application can open in the summer. Because then once all of that is finalized and approved by the committee, mm -hmm. Jessica still has to do all the work to open applications. I just don't think that's possible. I, I, I have to probably schedule additional meetings to do it or, you know, work. Right. Given, given where 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 the committee is at, yeah. uh, the level of discussion that has been able to take place and the desire to really be specific on how you want to move forward, that that was one of the reason we shifted to consider a renewal for this year to give right. you an ex extra time to really go through this. Yeah, I think we should do that. Think we need it. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I, I was under the impression we had to make a decision. Are we going to and I could be off. I'm sorry that we had that we that this group needs to make a decision if we're going to open it up for new or just renew who we are already funding to give us time to put together correct a, a layout 
right? Yeah. I thought that was the question we were trying to answer. Well, you're yeah. comfortable but with I wanna, time, I, I want to clarify, though, if we go for renewal, there's no reason we can't still go through that accountability and understand the work that they've done with the dollars they've received so oh, far, correct? Yeah. The work, correct. Yeah. The renewal wanna... really goes with the continued, like, we're continuing at similar pace, and we're definitely continuing those conversations. It just gives the committee a little extra time to make those decisions, and it might, yeah, it might shift. So that means that we may go to evaluation on how to pick up the evaluation for next year and then pick up the conversation around priorities, et cetera. It might switch the order, but the work itself needs to continue and happen. I just want to make sure I was, it's not like a check. We don't talk about it again. Still a lot of work, but absolutely necessary work. Yeah. Jessica, sorry. I think you had something to say. No, I I was just going to say, um, yes, absolutely. If we made this upcoming year a renewal year, um, then instead of looking at a rubric and talking about how to evaluate um, the conversation would shift to Council Member Burns's point. What are we evaluating? Are we evaluating the right things? Are we seeing the results that we're looking for? And if not, what do we need to change in our evaluation process to make sure we're measuring the outcomes we want to see? Um, and so I think that conversation would also be meaningful to the committee and inform the application process again when we open it. I think so too. And I think both of these things are very, personally, without those additional assessments and sort of outcomes, I would prefer to put our effort into how do we want to measure outcomes? What does this look like? So then when we have that assessment data, we can sort of marry the two. Um, so I would at this, given where we are and the information we have, I would prefer more time and have a renewal year. I agree with that. I would as well, because I think we can, we'll have the time to have these in-depth conversations. We can get it just the way that we want it and feel comfortable with, with the evaluation. Yeah, I would, I would just say if we could start that at the next meeting though, yeah. Because we probably, because in some ways, I think evaluations or assessments, whatever you want to call it, would be easier than prioritization because there's so little money, you know, and there's there's so much need. How do you pick housing over early childhood over? You know, what I mean, that's 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 rough. But I've I've always been more concerned about just making sure that we're um, we're incentivizing the right behavior in organizations and that would we understand the level of impact they're making and that we know they're on a path to continue growing and making even more of an impact. And at the point where they stop doing that, we should be prepared to pivot to maybe other organizations that yeah. are up and coming and doing really, you know, innovative work perhaps. So, um, so yeah, I look forward to those discussions. Thank you. Perfect. Is that helpful? Do we have to, we will have to take a, do we have to take a vote on that? No vote is needed, but Jessica, is that enough information? Yes, that is very helpful. I, I believe that was any other comments or items for this evening. I get through the whole agenda. Okay. Any other, I saw a couple of people maybe online, any public comment or additional? All right. With that, a motion to adjourn and the social services committee adjourn for the evening. Thank you. Awesome.